Hello and welcome to Wilson Center Now, a production of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. I'm John Molesky. My guests today, I have two of them for you. One is Duncan Wood. You've met Duncan before. He's the Wilson Center's Vice President for Strategy and New Initiatives. Duncan is also a senior advisor to the Mexico Institute. He joins us to discuss one of the center's newest initiatives, a special focus on infrastructure, which leads to our next guest, who is Sadek Waba, a senior fellow at NYU's Development Research Institute and a former World Bank economist. Sadak is chairman and managing partner of I Squared Capital and also a member of the Wilson Center's Global Advisory Council. His recent paper, which is available at wilsoncenter.org, is titled Integrating Infrastructure in U.S. Domestic and Foreign Policy, Lessons from China, and we'll hear more about that in just a moment. But Duncan, if we could begin with you, last time you and I spoke on this program, you introduced us to a special project centering around supply chains, and I understand that this initiative overlaps with that one. Could you tell us about it? Absolutely, John. And uh, you know, first of all, I'd, I'd like to congratulate Sadek for the for the paper. It's uh, it's an exciting new departure for us in many ways, um, and. As you just mentioned, the overlap between issues of infrastructure and infrastructure diplomacy with our work on supply chains and other work that we have coming down the pipeline on transportation and mobility um, is, is considerable. And it's, it's extraordinarily exciting because traditionally here at the Wilson Center, we have had a focus on questions of foreign policy, international security, human rights, et cetera. But we haven't done so much on international economic issues. This is an issue which obviously is of great political relevance today in the United States. But as we can see by many of the examples that Sadek put in his paper, this is a, uh, an incredibly powerful tool for foreign policy, something that other countries have been doing for a while, in particular the Chinese, and something which we need to think about if we're thinking about United States geopolitical goals as well as many of the things that we're trying to do here in this country with, relevant, with regards to climate change and basic improvement of the standard of living of, uh, of Americans. Thanks, Duncan. Sadek, what, one of the things Duncan and I spoke about when we talked about supply chains is that it's the kind of thing that, unless it's not working, we don't really notice it. Is it is, would, would that be the same reason that there's some complacency around infrastructure? When it's working, we don't pay attention to it. Absolutely. First of all, uh, great to be with you, uh, Duncan and John. Uh, it's a real pleasure. Uh, the, the fact is that over the last three decades or more, uh, we in the U.S. have not really invested in our infrastructure. Um, we, when you compare it to the 1950s, uh, invested heavily. Think of Eisenhower's investment in uh, national highway uh, systems. Uh, today, uh, our investment in infrastructure as a percentage of GDP is uh, less than 1%. Uh, but in fact, infrastructure is critical to economic development, uh, sustainable economic growth. Uh, it's critical for productivity. If we want to maintain American productivity over the coming decades and maintain our dominance and continue to grow, uh, we need to improve our infrastructure. That includes water, transport, uh, a better grid system. We've seen what happened with Hurricane Ida. We've seen what happened in Texas in winter. Uh, so, and on and on and on. So you have to be able to invest in our infrastructure, which is critical. Another element which Duncan referred to, as you invest in infrastructure, you also help uh, alleviate poverty and reduce income inequality. You know, why do people not make these obvious connections? I mean, when you're driving down the highway, that's just the most primal, almost infrastructure that most people engage on any given day. You know, if, if, if bridges are out, if things don't work, everything comes to a grinding halt. And yet people don't seem to be as focused on it as, well, certainly not based on political action and funding. Well, I'll tell you something. We conducted uh, several weeks ago a survey uh, that asked exactly that question. And interestingly, um, when you ask what is the single most important thing for you today, and we provide them different type of options, including COVID, including unemployment, including mm -hmm. improving our infrastructure, guess what? Number one was infrastructure. That really surprised me. Uh, and that's because people feel the impact of the lack of good infrastructure, especially in the context of COVID. 
um, uh, ability to have good internet, Wi-Fi, ability to have clean water, uh, ability to Duncan's earlier points when you think about logistics, uh, to be able to have access to goods. Uh, so all of that, I think people felt it during the pandemic. So your survey would indicate that the disconnect is between what people want and what politicians are delivering. Yes, unfortunately, that seems to be the case in many things, not just infrastructure. <laughs> and in that case, uh, that unfortunately applies too. Although I would say that this current administration, the Biden administration, has done an extraordinary work, uh, I think on a bipartisan basis also, uh, to really put together an infrastructure plan that uh, hopefully when you think about a trillion dollars that's going to be spent and invested over the coming six to eight years, I think hopefully that will help uh, if you want uh, improve things compared to what has happened in the last couple of years. Is Sadek, the level if of- I, if I can, uh, Sorry, John, if I may. No, please, Duncan, please go ahead. Sadik, if I can jump in here, I, I wanted to, uh, to ask you a question about uh, something which, which matters a great deal to me, and we've got a body of work here in the Wilson Center focused on it, which is really human capital development. And one of the points that is made uh, in, in your work is that you know, in many ways, we've forgotten how to do infrastructure well here in the United States. Having a focus on it, working with our allies, working internationally, will give us the chance for some cross-fertilization of ideas, of training, education, etc. Something that I think um, has the potential to bear enormous fruit in the long term. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that. Absolutely. The, the, the work in terms of developing one's infrastructure is not something that you can do all by yourself. Uh, although the exception is of course, staring us in the face, which is what China did. Um, and I think it's important to talk a little bit about that uh, before really fully answering your question. China, uh, since the 1980s has invested over 8% of its GDP in infrastructure. Uh, they did it all with internal resources. And for them, it was absolutely critical to develop that infrastructure because there's a direct correlation between better infrastructure and economic growth. So they built airports, they built roads, they built massive power generation to effectively sustain and support and generate that economic growth. Uh, what has happened is, of course, as they did that by the 2010s, uh, China found itself with a huge industry serving infrastructure. And their goal was, I have all these resources. I spent billions of dollars, hundreds of billions of dollars creating, to your question, the human capital that supported. What do I do with it? Because I have now a relatively mature system. And what they did is they exported it, which makes sense. Anyone would do that. I want to win uh, bigger markets. And, and that's something that the US has to do, which is to be able to generate the resources both internally, work as you said, Duncan, with our allies to be able to revitalize our own infrastructure. That means investing ourselves in our infrastructure, but also seeking uh, help or support from our allies. Let's speak a little more or hear your thoughts a bit more on China's use of infrastructure as a foreign policy initiative, the Belt and Road Initiative, and how in this country, generally our discussions about infrastructure treat it as if it's almost exclusively a domestic issue. Can you speak to that? Absolutely. And, and in a way, that question goes to the core of uh, the paper, which is, in fact, investing in infrastructure is a domestic issue, but it's also related to the foreign policy issue that we're trying uh, to develop. Uh, what the US did very successfully in a post-World War II era was effectively export its capital uh, to build uh, the infrastructure in Europe, hence the Marshall Plan, hence the Bretton Woods Agreements and the creation of the World Bank, which its technical name is the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development. At the time, it was not the reconstruction development of emerging markets, it was the reconstruction development of Europe in post-World War II. And so that's a key element. A strong domestic infrastructure allows you to have, as part of it, a strong foreign infrastructure policy, which allows us to invest with our allies in different countries. That means that we then are able to use that foreign policy to come and invest back into the US. So you have a virtuous cycle. Uh, and I don't think we should put it in terms of 
us versus China or anyone else. Uh, at the end of the day, what China has done through the Belt and Road Initiative that you mentioned, uh, and, and I understand it's a little bit controversial, but if you really look into what they've done, they've really tried to do two things. Number one, export their know-how because they have a lot of it. And at the end of the day, they can't build more airports in China, although they are doing more, but they want to export their know-how and the industry. And at the same time, trying to build bridges and ensure that they have access to the resources they want to. Any country would do it. We, we should do it. We're not doing it, but it's time that we start. I think this is one of the, uh, the, the most important underlying messages of your paper, Sadek, which is that you know, today in Washington and other capitals around the world, uh, it's all too common to see a demonization of China, to say whatever the Chinese are doing is by definition wrong. What your paper does is it says, okay, look at what they're doing. They're being successful on it. What is it that we can learn from this experience? And of course, we can come back to the, uh, you know, the, the old chestnuts of uh, well, the Chinese have a you know, 100 or 500 year view of, of, of history and, and of development. But it's also about doing things right. It's about actually uh, you know, avoiding fundamental mistakes. It's about aligning policies. And it's about having impact. Um, and yes, 8% of GDP is an enormous amount of money to spend on, on infrastructure. Right. But here in the United States, it's not as though we're short of money. There's, there's lots of money. It's how we choose to spend it and how we get most bang for our buck. That, that, that's absolutely right. And what we've tried to do is to explore ways uh, on a bipartisan basis that would allow investment in infrastructure without, if you want, going into areas which could be controversial. For example, increasing taxes uh, or increasing the budget deficit. And so that's why one of the uh, measures that I've proposed is, for example, the creation of an infrastructure bank. An infrastructure bank would allow you to do two things. Number one, galvanize the capital to invest in infrastructure. And number two, do it in a way which is outside of the appropriation cycle. Because infrastructure assets tend to be of a long uh, duration nature, it, you can't build a bridge in, in overnight. So it requires preparation. So by the time you decide to build a bridge, it can take you three, four, five years. And so you want to have a long-term view of funding our infrastructure. An infrastructure bank can do that. Another way of doing it is, for example, create IRA accounts. You and I put some money aside for our retirement plans or for 529, which is for education for our children if we want to. We should be able to create an IRA account that allows all of us the option to invest in our own infrastructure. I think a lot of people will be interested in investing in the airport next door, in the road that they use, and that's another way to use the savings that we have within the US. The third measure is, for example, pension funds. US pension funds invest roughly 1% of their assets in infrastructure, uh, Canadian funds 8%, Australian funds 6%, some of the major Canadian state pension funds have invested over 30% in infrastructure globally. So we should encourage our state pension funds to invest in infrastructure. And then I would suggest we should, in, in, as I said earlier, encourage some of the foreign pension funds to come and invest in the US. And maybe controversially, at the right time, in the, wrong, in the right context, but, and in the context of a broad, understanding with China, ask Chinese capital to invest in our own infrastructure, so long as we have an agreement on the best way to do it and ensure that it doesn't infringe our national security and so on and so forth. John, I'd like to make a very quick comment on it and then back to you, but uh, uh, just another crossover between what Sadek is talking about and our supply chains work. And uh, we just completed our first paper on critical minerals. Um, and one of the issues that's come up time and time again is the time it takes to actually get a project underway here in the United States. Whereas in Australia and Canada, it takes two years to get the necessary permits here in the United States between seven to 10 years. Now that ultimately costs the country competitiveness. And in the case of both infrastructure and of critical minerals, it can actually it directly impact upon national security and our ability to get things done that we need to get done. So I just, I, I think that you know, all of these issues, when we actually come down to it, there's some 
quite dull and mundane things that we need to do, but which actually shouldn't be that difficult if we look at the best practices in other parts of the world. So, Dick, I, I want to ask you about this moment in history where the U.S. and China diverged on their approaches to infrastructure. It's easy to understand China, China's motivation to become more of a global player and to look outward. It's more difficult to understand why the U.S. essentially not fully got out of the infrastructure business, but made it less of a priority. What were the factors that caused that? It's a very interesting question. And in a way, it's a very complex one, which is not easy to identify. Part of it was, of course, uh, the uh, beginnings, if you want, of political gridlock in Washington, D.C., which made it very difficult to identify long-term sources of capital for infrastructure. Uh, There was very good investment in the 60s, And people felt that, well, that infrastructure will last for as long as we want. And of course, that's not true at all. Uh, If you look at some of the reports today that are published uh, and estimate the amount that you need to invest in infrastructure, it's anywhere between three to $5 trillion just to maintain our infrastructure. Forget about putting it into the 21st century. So that size of investment uh, or gap, if you want, could not have happened Um, unless we effectively abandoned investment in infrastructure. So there was this huge cumulative effect over the last couple of decades. So one is the gridlock. The second is that a lot of these assets were effectively in the control of states, municipalities that found themselves overwhelmed with demands, whether it's health, education, and so on. And ultimately infrastructure took a backseat. A third element is user fees it became controversial to think of paying for infrastructure uh, using user fees. So for example, if you think about the gasoline tax has not, which is used to maintain our national highway system, the gasoline tax has not been changed since 1993. So that in real terms, so nominal terms it stayed fixed, unchanged since 93, but in real terms, it's gone down by 70%. So it's not possible to want to expand, improve our highways and have essentially the tax, which is used to maintain that go down by 70%. So all of these made it very difficult to continue to maintain. That in turn meant there was less interest in maintaining our human capital associated with infrastructure, engineers, urban planning, and so on and so forth, uh, construction companies, so that very quickly, you've seen the leading construction companies globally are Chinese, Spanish, Australian, Canadian. Why? Because they had the ability to develop their own infrastructure in their own countries over the last couple of decades. I wanna ask both of you to weigh in on this idea and that is how climate change overlaps with what we're talking about. Certainly killer storms and raging wildfires have exposed vulnerabilities in American infrastructure and in places around the globe. And we haven't, I think yet used the term resilience but I think that also is part of the equation when we're talking about infrastructure. How have you factored this into your thinking? And Duncan, how does this factor into the Wilson Center's approach to the subject matter? Go ahead, Sarah. All infrastructure really ought to be green infrastructure. Um, Today, people say, I like to invest in green infrastructure. Um, The the answer is that there's no green and non-green. At the end of the day, all infrastructure should be green. Uh, If you develop a highway, you're using uh, asphalt, you're using cement. All of these are ultimately inputs that are quite um, high in terms of carbon emission. So we need to be able to introduce across the entire value chain, the ability to ensure that we minimize GHG emission across the the board so that when we come to look at our infrastructure, we're able to effectively get as green as possible. We've done a great job uh, in the technology associated with renewables. Look at the solar panels have come down in cost, uh, wind, um, but of course, to produce these steel blades, uh, you need steel. And of course, steel uses a lot of coal. So when you think about it, you, yes, we're doing something great by using wind. At the same time, we have to take into account the fact that those steel blades um, are in fact 
uh, built on the basis of quite a bit of carbon emission. So it's a whole cycle that needs to be taken into account. And I think people are doing it not, right now. And I think the recent bills that are in Congress uh, hopefully will account for that uh, climate impact. It's interesting, uh, John and Sadek, we, uh, we've been looking at the, the carbon life cycle of different industries. And you know, one great example, of course, is the automobile industry. And a lot of auto producers these days are looking at the life cycle, not just of the uh, of the doors and the wheels, but of the battery itself. You know, and particularly in electric vehicles, they're saying, look, we're going to build a, a, a green vehicle. We need to make sure that this has minimal carbon emissions in its actual construction, in addition to what it pollutes or produces out there on the streets. And you know, so that's the first thing. I think this is a this is an increasingly common approach. Second. Um, infrastructure in general. Um, look at what we've just observed um, with New Orleans and the, uh, you know, the, the floods uh, in, in Louisiana. Um, the levees that were put in place there after Katrina helped a great deal, but they weren't enough because, of course, the, the amount of rain that fell in such a short time meant that you, know, you couldn't escape from the water no matter where you were. It was much better than it would have been, but you still need to think in a more proactive and ever-changing, flexible fashion about this. And lastly, I would say, um, you know, we need to think about how we can begin to redefine some of the traditional product products that we use, and we think of as being sometimes dirty products. But in fact, they may be a bridge to getting us to the cleaner elements. You know, natural gas is the best example of this, where you know it's still a hydrocarbon, it still pollutes, but it pollutes less than some of the other uh, fuels that are out there. As right. important bridge to the future, we need to think the same way about many of the critical minerals that we that we use in our industry. They may actually be tools that can get us to a greener future. So thinking in a more holistic way, in a more integrated way across the board, is what we really need at this point. Sadek, so much of what you've shared with us today, and, and certainly your paper, uh, it's that, as President uh, George Herbert Walker Bush called it, that vision thing. And progress often comes down to a, the notion of a vision to rally around. Where is the leadership coming from in this area? And for some of the things that you've talked about, things like uh, international cooperation among allies around infrastructure, are there voices that are leading the way? Are there ideas we should be paying attention to? Yeah, I, I think so. Um, if you look at what uh, the Biden is, administration has done uh, since January, they've really focused on two things when it comes to infrastructure. Number one, uh, build back better within our own country. So we need to upgrade our infrastructure. And I think they were able to reach the other side of the aisle and you have a bipartisan bill, which hopefully will pass by the end of this month, September. So I think that will be a huge boost as we talked. Uh, the second element is a recognition that a strong domestic infrastructure also means to have a strong foreign domestic infrastructure policy. And so that's why at the uh, G5, they talked about Build Back Better World, uh, which is trying to bring a lot of countries into focusing on the infrastructure that is needed in emerging markets. Uh, I would not uh, couch it in terms of uh, the West versus China, I think it's a mistake. I think it's infrastructure is one of those key areas where there is the ability to cooperate. Uh, and that's where uh, we need to, the leadership to really focus. Uh, we can compete with China on many other things, but when it comes to infrastructure, they have, and we have to acknowledge it, have done an extraordinary work over the last couple of decades. And we have to ask our question, is that an area where we can work together, uh, both in terms of supporting other countries and possibly supporting our own? A and that requires a give and take with them and understand how the Belt and Road Initiative can be effectively enhanced in a way that maintains international uh, rule system uh, that is done in a way that is beneficial to the countries uh, that benefit from the BRI. And the fact is the World Bank has done a quite extensive amount of studies on the BRI and on the whole have found that what they've done is actually pretty good. Duncan, any thoughts on, on leadership and on that the, the so-called vision thing? There's so one thing that I would uh, I would add to what Sadak has said is that uh, you know he, he made the point about making sure these things are done right. 
And I think that one of the areas that the United States can still lead on is on questions of ESG, uh, economic, social issues, governance issues, in particular transparency and disclosure. Um, these are issues which come up time and time again. The United States is becoming more and more interested in these issues globally. I think that on infrastructure projects, there is huge scope for corruption. And the United States can take a leading role on that one issue in making sure there's greater transparency because we all want to avoid that. And when we see that uh, anti-corruption uh, plays a major role in US policy right now towards Central America, um, we see it as a hot topic of discussion around the world. Why not extend this into the conversation over infrastructure as well? Look, th that's an excellent point. Uh, I, I think issues of transparency, uh, pushing ESG, um, um, uh, anti-corruption policies, all are areas that the United States can lead in. In addition, uh, and that's key, uh, in addition to leading with capital, both financial and human capital. So, Doug, I want to get a final thought from you on how we should think about this. You mentioned uh, internet access early on. I, I think that when a lot of people think of infrastructure, maybe I'm projecting here, but I think they think of bricks and mortar and those types of projects, but it's more, it's bigger than that. And you've made that point directly and indirectly. Uh, how should we think about it? And what is the cost of failure? The cost of failure is unfortunately uh, lower productivity uh, and the ability to and the inability to be able to grow uh, both our resources, our human capital. And so that is going to cost us. I said elsewhere that it will be tragic for the United States and for the people of the US if we're not able to invest in infrastructure over the coming decade. We have all of the ingredients to do it. Um, and so we should absolutely focus on making it a success. Uh, the infra definition of infrastructure now is much broader. It is not bridges, it's not just roads, uh, but it's digital infrastructure, uh, it's health infrastructure. So I don't want to make it look as if everything is infrastructure, but the fact is uh, health and education, uh, better school buildings, uh, Wi-Fi access to the schools, all that is part of the infrastructure. And so we should look at it from a more holistic perspective uh, rather than just have a limited focus on what I would call <clears throat> traditional infrastructure, which is, you know, uh, bridges and roads. Well, gentlemen, thank you for helping us uh, think of it in a larger way today. Fascinating discussion. Hope we can do it again. Sadek Waba, Duncan Wood, thanks for joining us. Great. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed this edition of Wilson Center. Now and that you'll join us again soon. Until then, for all of us at the center, I'm John Molesky. Thanks for being here.